correction for a learning disability. And it was originally taught that you find this in children of learning disabilities. And there's a correction for it, which, tremen which tremendously helps the child who has a learning disability. But when we got back to our office and we started checking, we found plenty of adults had the same thing. Not just children, but adults have learning disabilities also. It is so therapeutic. It is so therapeutic. Let me give you an example. We had a patient who came up on the table and had this. We corrected her, and then she re re the next day she reported back to us that all her life she could either take notes or she could listen to the instructor, but she couldn't do both at the same time. She couldn't listen and write notes at the same time. And after we did this learning disability correction fault, after we did that, now the next day she could do both at the same time, and she was thrilled to death that she could do both things at the same time. So that's a powerful thing if you can accomplish that. So who'd like to be checked for a learning disability? <laughs> Half the room. <laughs> this is critical on polarity. It has to be a positive finger on the right. It has to be a negative finger on the left. And you're going to touch the roof of the mouth like this. Now, we're going to make sure we have a good test indicator. So it's. OK, now touch the roof of your mouth. Her fingers are side by side. The pads are up, touching the hard palate. <clears throat> and she has it. Now, just for the heck of it, use the two middle fingers. Can, can you do that? Nothing. It has to be the index fingers. Or technically, it could be the ring fingers. That, that would work if you put the ring fingers up there. But it has to be positive on the right, negative on the left. Index fingers qualify, ring fingers qualify, middle fingers do not qualify. Or these two would not qualify other, either. OK. Positive on the right, negative on the left. If, if that blows out your indicator muscle, then she has it. And these people, uh, they don't think of themselves as having a learning disability. But, the, but here's a symptom they have. Uh, they're doing something, and their mind wanders off onto a different topic. Wait, wait a minute, I'm doing this. And, and, and then they realize, wait a minute, all of a sudden they're over here doing something else in their mind. They can't concentrate. Their mind wanders on them. We can fix that so they can concentrate. Well, you can see how that would help a child in school. Now, a common thing you find in these people, common, it doesn't mean every single person, but common, that there is a convexity in the roof of the mouth. Normally, our mouth is a smooth concavity. We're talking about the hard palate. But in these people, they'll have a little bump in the roof of the mouth that sticks down. It's like a, like a convexity instead of a concavity. So the correction is you're going to push up on the hard palate as if you're trying to make it more concave. As the patient breathes in, and your other hand is pushing down, so your finger and two hands are going closer together. This is an exaggeration in the mouth. Got it? Oh, it doesn't hurt. It does not hurt one single bit because you're pressing on the hard palate. You're not pressing on the soft palate. Oh, you, you got it. She's she, got it big, yeah. That's she, she's got the convexity in the roof of her mouth. OK, so breathe in. Okay, seven times, touch the roof of your mouth, 
hold the leg up, and it's gone. But it really is a bump in the roof of her mouth that sticks down like a convexity. It's supposed to be a concavity. Now, the convexity is not always there. All you need as an indicator is these two fingers. You don't have to have the convexity, but if you do have the convexity, her condition is worse, meaning it's more exaggerated, that, that she has trouble concentrating. And uh, if you don't have finger cots with you, you could use a tissue to cover your finger with a tissue and push up in there. If I have them do it, I have them use their thumb. And push up as you breathe in. Yeah, they could, they could do it. No, they breathe. Except if it's a, if it's a child who's very young and uh, you can't control making the child breathe in when they're supposed to, then because you're touching the child, then the surrogate effect works as you're touching the child and you, and you do the breathing in. Or uh, if the child's really young and won't let you stick their finger in their mouth, or you're afraid of getting your finger bit off, <laughs> uh, the mother holds the child and you do the correction in the mother completely. It works on the child because of the surrogate effect. And the way you know that's the baby and not the mother is because when you take the baby out of the circuit, the mother doesn't have it. But you put the baby in the circuit and now the mother has it. That's how you know it's coming from the mother rather than from the child. That's true of any circuit testing. You can test before and after to show which one it's coming from. Fantastic trick to know. See, the more tricks you learn, the better are your chances of success when the mayor's wife comes in or the governor's wife comes in. You, you don't want to fail when they come in. You want to succeed. And the more tricks you know, the better your armamentarium, the better the bag of tricks you have to draw from. You can't test every, pa every patient for every single thing you know, especially if you had a class like this. <laughs> so you try to check those things that would be apropos to the circuit of complaint or the area of complaint. And you're doing this because they can't concentrate, their mind wanders off on them. And this is the treatment we use for ADH, hyperactivity. This is, the, this is the correction we do for hyperactivity. In, in Europe, they don't even use that diagnosis. It's, it's an American made up diagnosis for an excuse to, to prescribe more Ritalin. Did you know they found out that the, the people that sold Ritalin falsified the, the research to get it on the market? And you know what they did? Slapped them on the wrist and left it on the market. For example, if, if Ritalin helps hyperactivity children, why does Ritalin help narcolepsy? Aren't those opposite conditions? Narcolepsy, the, the guy falls asleep. A hyperactive child can't sit still in the classroom. They give him both Ritalin. And both cases are helped. Why does that help both cases? Because Ritalin is so powerful, it blows the circuit breaker on that circuit, which makes the muscles turn off. So uh, in adults, it wakes them up. And in children, uh, it, makes them, it makes the muscle overactive, which blows the circuit breaker, and uh, which makes the muscle calm down. Not, not a nice way to treat the child to overdose them on something. But dynamite uh, <clears throat> results in doing this. And now that you know how to check it, you'd be surprised how many adults you find this on. And the payoff is they can now concentrate without their minds wandering off onto a different topic. Okay, any questions on what you saw there?
The question was, would this help autism? And the answer is yes. Is it a guaranteed cure for autism? No. But it definitely helps. Her question was, do you have anything else for autism? Um, these people have lymph gland congestion. Now, the lymph glands don't have a separate pump to move the fluid like the blood does. The blood has the heart to pump the fluid around, but the lymph glands do not have a separate pump. And that's why lymph glands are only located in areas of high activity, here, 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 because when you, when you move those areas, you know, you're, you're milking the lymph glands. And so those kids who are hyperactive, those kids are trying to fix themselves. Because they, they get better with activity. The best thing for those kids is turn them loose on the playground. Let them run ragged. So what's Ritalin do? Ritalin does the exact opposite. Turns them into a zombie. They don't feel like exercising or playing when they're on Ritalin. They just, they just want to sit around and mope. It's ironic that it destroys the very thing the kids are trying to fix. The, the kid is trying to fix himself when he's active like that. Get him a lymphatic massage. Work the lymph glands. The single best exercise for that is a mini trampoline. When you jump on a mini, mini trampoline, the milking action is fantastic for milking the lymph glands in the whole body. Fantastic uh, exercise for the lymph glands. Nutritionally speaking, we use the herb skull cap. Skull cap is the herb we use for lymph gland congestion. And there's a portamorphogen called thymex for the thymus tissue that helps move lymph fluid also. So if you put a kid on thymex skull cap, jump on a trampoline, you could fix his hyperactivity without giving him Ritalin. Ritalin's a very unnatural thing to do, as exemplified by why does it, does it, why does it do the opposite in children and adults? Any questions on that? He said, does, does it help reading when you can't comprehend what you're reading or you don't remember what you read? Absolutely. It helps you remember what you read because it improves your ability to concentrate. One, one more trick for your armamentarium. The more tricks you have in your armamentarium, the greater your chances are for success. That's a good question. Is it more of a focus thing rather than learning something new? And the answer is yes. They can focus better. Did you know the average person <clears throat> can't concentrate on the, a single subject for maybe more than 30 seconds? 30 seconds later, they say, oh, I hear the dog barking over there. Or they, 30 seconds later, oh, I hear the garbage can banging over in the alley. Their mind wandered off of the thing they were concentrating on. It's a good exercise to see how long you can keep your mind on something and not let it wander off on you. Most, most people can't concentrate worth a darn. If you learn to discipline your mind where you can concentrate and not let it wander off, that discipline is beneficial for many, many different things. Just like if you can discipline yourself to exercise, that's a physical thing. But that discipline uh, carries over to other departments of your life where you can uh, be disciplined to keep a diary and write in your diary every single night before bed and not skip any nights. Just doing things like cross collar every morning, tap around the navel every morning, brush your scalp with a hairbrush every morning. Uh, consistency pays off. They're recently um, giving kudos to Jay Leno that one of his strengths was his consistency. Rather than being a super talented guy, his success was more attributable to his consistency, or you may call that willpower. Well, I'm telling you, you can, you can increase your willpower by doing this. 
The question was, uh, people that have the learning disability cranial fault, how often should they do it? And the answer is daily. Every day, do it 10 times. <laughs> you can do it yourself, or a mother may have to do it to the child. Some children, if they're old enough, you can teach it to do it to themselves. The adults can do it to themselves. Every day is the answer. You cannot overdo it. You, you don't need to worry about the roof of the mouth becoming too concave. That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, be, behind the front teeth, the, what we call the hard palate. Don't go back far enough to get the soft palate. You want the hard palate. No pain whatsoever to push on that. And I say that to the patient. Uh, I'm going to put my finger in your mouth. This does not hurt. Well, the, the bump should be in the center of the hard palate. And so the answer is yes, do press on the bump. Now, just to be realistic, the bump doesn't disappear just because you did that one time. But if you do it every day, the bump will eventually disappear. So, so the bump will get less and less and less. Not that it goes away in one, one treatment. If they have a bridge in the roof of their mouth, that was his question. It'd be better if they took the bridge out so you could press directly on the hard palate if they have a plate in there. Now, the plate in there is okay just for testing purposes. If they're going to do this, they can, they can touch with the plate still in there to see if they have it or not. But if they do have it and now you need to do the correction, it's better to take the plate out to do the correction. And if we're doing it to themselves, they should take it out before they do the correction. He said if you push uh, the tongue on the roof of the mouth, it increases the alpha waves produced by the brain. Kinesiologically speaking, uh, pressing the tongue on the roof of the mouth will make things therapy localized that otherwise wouldn't show up. So it's a method of uh, finding hidden ones that don't show in the clear. Now, I'm not talking just about this one. I'm talking about therapy localization anywhere. If you can't get it to show up, you can't find any therapy localization in the area of complaint, have the patient put the tongue on the roof of the mouth and, and press up with their tongue, and that will show hidden problems that otherwise don't show up. It's one more piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Earlier in ICAK, you had to write uh, research papers to keep your diplomate status. And every year when I wrote a paper on a yet another technique, I would always, my last sentence would always be, this is another piece of the jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> so I kind of, I got myself a reputation for that quote. <laughs>